can I welcome you all most warmly as we come together on this, the third Sunday after Trinity. I hope and trust that your loved ones are all safe and well and that you are too. It seems quite likely that in the coming weeks we're going to be able to gather together in churches, but as yet it is very unclear what we'll be able to do. And I'm sure that there are some who will wish to continue to worship from the safety of their own homes. So we are making preparations to find a way to enable you to join in, to enable us all to join together with any service from the church in real time, or able to, to view the service later on as a recording. To that extent, we've experimented today with bringing two forms of worship, one from the, our own home here in Barmore Drive, and the other from St David's Church itself. We'd obviously be very interested in any feedback or comments that you have as we begin to just iron out some of the teething issues of delivering a service from the church building itself. And it's a great pleasure to welcome today the Reverend Ben Poulin, who is our preacher this morning. In our first hymn, O Lord, all the world belongs to you, we hear the assurance that God is always making all things new. And that includes our efforts to find a way forward as church. It is a great comfort as we explore our ways to live and relate to each other that we remember that we are rooted in a love that is eternal and belongs from the beginning of all time. And so we hear that hymn, O Lord, all the world belongs to you. ourselves up to the loving grace of God as we say together Almighty God to whom all hearts are open all desires known and from whom no secrets are hidden cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord Amen God 
God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us then confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. May the God of love and power forgive you and free you from your sins, heal and strengthen you by his Spirit, and raise you to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. So as forgiven people, we say together the words of the Gloria. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. So let us pray this to call it for the third Sunday after Trinity. Almighty God, you have broken the tyranny of sin and have sent the Spirit of your Son into our hearts, whereby we call you Father. Give us grace to dedicate our freedom to your service, that we and all creation may be brought to the glorious liberty of the children of God, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And so we hear our first two readings from the Bible. A reading from Jeremiah 28, verses 5 to 9. Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words that you have prophesied and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord and all the exiles. But listen now to this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets who preceded you and me from ancient times prophesied war, famine and pestilence against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, when the word of that prophet comes true, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Romans chapter 6, starting at verse 12 until the end. Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, 
since you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been free from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So as we reflect on those words of Jeremiah and the great promise that all the prophets throughout the ages have given and shared with us, we sing the hymn, God has spoken by the prophets. Thank mm -hmm. you.
Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the, the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their rewards. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. For the last three Sundays, readings from St Matthew's Gospel have taken us through chapter 10. The context is the sending out of the disciples on a trial mission to the Jews, as it were. Jesus spells out to them what they may expect to face, not then, but also in the years to come, as they undertake their calling to go in his name, to spread the gospel. It doesn't make for comfortable reading. You have to take no money, the minimum of clothing and equipment. You will be like sheep among the pack of wolves. People will question your motives and smear your reputations. You may be taken to court and have even members of your own family turn on you. Matthew wrote his gospel several decades after Christ's ascension and had seen such results as the infant church began to grow both in Israel and in the wider Gentile world. He may well have experienced some of these things for himself. And as we read the Acts of the Apostles, and the other New Testament letters and books, it's clear that persecution and hardship and martyrdom were regular experiences for the infant church. As we know, it continued to be hard for so many down through the centuries. And today it continues to be dangerous and challenging in so many places around the world. Sub-Sahara Africa, for example, or various places in the Middle East and the Indian subcontinent and the Far East. So many places where Christians face ongoing suspicion, persecution, oppression and even martyrdom. Jesus said to his disciples, if they call the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those, malign those of his household? In other words, that's what I face. You can expect no less. But as he gave out his warnings, he also sought to give assurance. The one who endures will be saved. Even the very hairs of your head are precious in God's eyes. Everyone who acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. Part of the problem, if not the problem, is fundamental to human nature. We resent challenge to our ways of life, our attitudes, beliefs and actions. If it is feared, they will upset our equilibrium. And if we cannot see anything in it for ourselves, such challenges resented, refuted, ignored, or opposed violently. The prophets of Israel many centuries before faced that same issue as exemplified in the book of Jeremiah. I can't help feeling sorry for Jeremiah he lived at a time of deep upheaval in Jewish history, 
and he responded to God's call to pronounce judgment against Judah for its failure to seek God's protection in the face of foreign domination. And as a result, he faced ridicule, plots against his life, beatings, imprisonment, and his writings were destroyed. At times he cried out to God, complaining of the unfairness of it all. I've done what you asked of me, Lord. Why do you let me suffer as a result? In today's Old Testament reading, we find a rival prophet, Hananiah, publicly and dramatically opposing Jeremiah's warning to the nation of imminent disaster if they do not turn back to God. Come off it, says Hannah. That is fake prophecy. We're all right. God has broken the threat from Babylon and will soon restore Judah's fortunes. But it was his prophecy that proved fake. There's a telling example of how people prefer to reject bad news that implicates them and calls for radical change. We see this phenomenon every day at all levels of human interaction. Very topically, there's a major example, the struggle for racial justice and equality. It's by no means a new issue. It has been going on for centuries, but meeting all sorts of resistance, tactics and reasoning from power groups and self-interest groups who are called to change their practices. Within the coronavirus shutdown, while most people have heeded government advice and are ready to take protective measures, we see other people unwilling to change their lifestyles. They dismiss the warnings. They're ready to ignore these measures and insist on meeting together as they have done. As an aside, whatever our politics, however well we feel our leaders at home and abroad are managing this great crisis, I wouldn't like to have the burden that is upon them in such unprecedented times. Those who hold the decision-making power for the peoples of the world and of the planet desperately need our prayers for informed and wise action. In these times, as Christians here in this country, we're lucky. While there are areas of conflict and tension, both within the church and in the wider world around, we do not face the kinds of extreme reactions Jesus warned his disciples about. Of course, life presents its pains and dark moments. We face crises and disruptions to the stability of our lifestyles. And these can challenge our faith and our trust in the saving grace of God to support and direct us through them. In our second reading, St Paul, using the example of slavery, reminds us that through our baptism and in faith, we have been crucified with Christ so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. We have, he says, been freed from sin and as it were enslaved to God, the end of which is our salvation. Though we may not face the kinds of hardship that so many Christians have faced down the ages and are facing, our readings remind us of our calling in Christ's name to live out our discipleship in the way that reflects Jesus' words, whoever welcomes you, welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me, welcomes the one who sent me. However sacrificial our calling may or may not be, as St Paul says elsewhere, if I give away all my possessions and give my body to be burned, but do not have love, I gain nothing. At the end of our Gospel reading, Jesus said, 
Whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. In many drought-riven areas, a cup of cold water is no mean gift. It is a gift of life itself. As I was very aware on my visit last year, to a drought-ridden area of Senegal. Senegal, like so many places, has experienced several critical periods of drought over the last decade. And in that country, it's left up to a quarter of a million people hungry. But in the context of our gospel reading, Jesus is talking of small acts of love and care, like so many are undertaking in this COVID lockdown. Making a phone call to ask how a friend or a stranger is doing. Dropping off groceries for the elderly. Simple reaching out to the lonely, the most vulnerable among us. Later in the gospel, Jesus said, I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. A cup of cold water. It is the smallest of gifts, a gift that almost anyone can give. It is such simple outreach to the needy around us that lies at the heart of sacred discipleship in Christ's name. I close with a quote from Mother Teresa, who worked in the slums of Calcutta. You can do no great things, only small things, with great love. Amen. Amen. So let us declare our faith in the God of love. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. So in the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. Lord, at this time of isolation and separation, keep us strong in faith. We may not be together in church, but we know that you are everywhere. Open our eyes that we may behold your fatherly presence around us. We pray for the Worldwide Church and in our deanery for the City Centre Churches, for Bishop Christine, Dean, Jeff Miller and all who work at the Cathedral and Church House. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We pray for our Queen and give thanks for her long reign. We pray for those still suffering the results of the conflict between Syria and the Yemen and hope for an improvement in the relationship between India and China. Lord, grant to all politicians and leaders the will and determination to work for a lasting peace on earth. We hold in our hearts all refugees and all who are persecuted Lord, support those whose lives are in peril through war, natural disaster, racial, racial intolerance or poverty. 
and strengthen the people and agencies who work with the vulnerable, working often in conditions which are hazardous. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We bring before you, Lord, and pray for all who feel lonely and isolated at this time, especially those shielding and separated from loved ones. We pray that as lockdown restrictions are gradually lifted, the vulnerable stay safe and we all enjoy our freedom responsibly. In our cycle of prayer, we pray and give thanks for our retired clergy, Ben, Christine and Ray. Also the charities we support and at the Saturday Cafe, Christian Aid, Children's Society and all the others. In these challenging times, we bring before you, Lord, all who are ill, and doctors, nurses, and all hospital staff caring for them. And we pray for all who have died and their families who mourn them. Finally, we give thanks for modern technology so we can share in worship in our homes. Rejoicing in the fellowship of Blessed Mary, Aidan and all your saints, we commend ourselves and all your people to your unfailing love. Amen. Amen. And so we bring our prayers together as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So we share together in the peace, a peace that binds us together. Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and we share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us offer one another, wherever we may be, a sign of peace. Peace be with you. that part in our service where I'm mindful that we are separate but yet together, mindful that our heart calls out for that which is sacred but also recognising the sacredness of our own homes, our own food, our own friendship and our own lives. We come to a point where we reflect on all that God has done for us in Christ to bring us hope, salvation to affirm our calling and to bring us together. Jesus, the true vine and bread of life, ever giving yourself that the world might live. Let us share your death and passion. Make us perfect in your love. Amen. Amen. And so we give thanks for the saving death and resurrection of Jesus and ask him to be with us now, wherever we may be. We say together, thanks be to you, Lord Jesus Christ, for all the benefits you have given me, for all the pains and insults you have borne for me. 
Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I ask you to come spiritually into my heart. O oh, most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, may I know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day. Amen. And so we say, Lord, in these days of mercy, make us quiet and prayerful. In these days of challenge, make us stronger in you. In these days of emptiness, take possession of us. In these days of waiting, open our hearts to the mystery of your cross. God of life, who for our redemption gave your only begotten Son to the death of the cross, and by his glorious resurrection have delivered us from the power of our enemy, grant us so to die daily to sin, that we may evermore live with him in the joy of his risen life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And so as we draw our service to a close, we receive God's blessing as he blesses us to be a blessing to others, to share his love and to be part of his great movement of love in the world, lots of small acts given in great love. And so may God, the Holy Trinity, make you strong in faith and love, defend you on every side and guide you in truth and peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you and all those whom you love and all those whom you are called to serve this day and always. Amen. And so in that spirit of service, we draw our service to a close by singing that lovely hymn, Brother, Sister, Let Me Serve You.
for as we depart from this time together, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.